um, in that journey. So yeah, 2006 was my um, first ever testing job. So during my uh, university degree, I had the opportunity to work uh, as a placement year and I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, Vernon says he can't hear me. Can everyone else hear me? Can you hear me, Hilary? Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's just you, Vernon. It's a feature no of um, my webinars, Vernon, that you can't hear me. Um, so, yeah, in uh, 2006, I did a placement year, and I joined the regression testing team um, at, Mind at Lloyd's TSB, and it was part of my university placement. I didn't know what to expect, didn't even know what testing was. I just needed to get a job in order to get my graduation. <laughs> and so I took the one that was closest to my home and took it. So yeah, I joined there. It was actually really insightful. Um, I got to, I got to uh, do automation a very long time ago using a tool called uh, QA Run, uh, which was by CompuWare. And then that later migrated to QTP. Uh, which had just been launched at the time, which obviously now has um, been taken over by uh, MicroFocus, I believe. Um, and I also got to do testing, but it was really like told what to do, do this, do that. But anyway, that was my introduction to testing. Um, but while I was there, in 2007, uh, I did my ISTQB exam. Now, again, I didn't know <laughs> what ISTQB was, uh, I was told that I was going on this course. And the best thing was, there was 30 placement students at the bank um, from a variety of roles, HR, programmers, testers, designers, graphic designers. And the bank put every single one of us onto this ISTQB course, which I've later realized was to justify the cost of the course and spread it across everyone. Um, but yeah, I didn't know what it was. I didn't understand the term, but it actually turned out to be very useful in my career. Um, and that's where I now talk about ISTQB. It's a tick in the box. And I didn't know it was a tick in the box. Um, but now it's very much seen as a tick in the box, whether we like it or not. Um, it's a tick in the box. I don't like their material, but I, if everyone asks me to get a career in testing these days, um, I say, just do the exam. Don't go on a course, take the exam, take it 20 times until you pass it. Uh, and carry on because I guess um, I can't see the chat, so we can't play the game. But you had to get forty percent to pass this exam when I took it. It was a, I, it was I said at the time. I got forty two. I got forty two percent. I just passed, and now I am a fully qualified, certified software tester, and I can go and get whatever job I want. Um, but that's a failure. No, forty two percent is shocking. Anyway, it helped me get my first job. Um, so straight after uni, I was looking on job websites, looking at placement jobs, 12 grand uh, graduate jobs. And one day I thought, what about testing jobs? And testing jobs, well, testing jobs started at 20 grand. That was amazing. So I applied, I had my um, ISTQB tick, and I got my first job in uh, Manchester uh, for a travel agent um, software. But one thing I learned in that first job on reflection, I did what I was told. I didn't ask any questions. I got handed test scripts and I did what I was asked to do. I wasn't confident enough to push back, but also more importantly, I didn't know what was good and what was bad. So I just went with the flow. I did what I was asked to do. I didn't really do any more. I left the moment I could leave like, as in like at the end of the day. And I didn't ask enough questions. Um, I didn't ask, why do you want me to do this? Why do you want me to test that? Why do you want me to test it this way? Why that tool? I just took it. Uh, and I think on reflection now, I, I probably would have accelerated a lot quicker if I started asking questions, but we'll soon um, see around that. So in 2010, um, I'd been dating my current partner and we and she moved um, to do some studying and I decided it was time to move um, as well. And I took the first job I could get because I was scared of not having a job. I was scared of not being employed. So the first job that came up, I took it, and it was the worst domain I have ever worked in. Um, and I realized that domain mattered to me. So I love testing, but I like to be in a specific domain. And this domain was signal um, signaling in the network rail in the train systems. Now, I know a guy from Switzerland who got to work on the Gotthard Tunnel, I think it was called. 
And he had an amazing time. I didn't get to work on anything near as exciting. I got to work on really old signaling that changed the traffic lights to blue and green. <laughs> that was all I got to do. Um, but more importantly, uh, the people there just weren't, um, they didn't care about their career. They were quite, well, that's not true. They, they probably did, but they didn't really show it. Uh, they would do the necessary, um, but move on. And I started to realize now that context mattered to me and people mattered to me. Uh, testing was testing, and I was quite happy just doing my testing. But I realized that to be happy, um, I needed to work in a domain that interested me and with people that um, were, were um, like people I could bounce off. But yeah, so that one, that one made me a little bit sad. Um, and I left after six months. Um, I did not enjoy that place at all, but it did help me move. So it served its purpose. It helped me move, um, but wasn't as rewarding as, um, some, as it could have been. So this brings us on now six years. So I've been testing for six years at this point, um, and I built up my skill set. Uh, I was getting quite adapt with um, strong testing capabilities. I was finding lots of bugs. I was good at communicating, started dabbling in automation and stuff like that. And I landed myself a job at a digital marketing agency, and the people were awesome. These were the people you wanted to be around, creative people, people willing to share and collaborate, apart from one person, my test manager. My test manager didn't want me to collaborate. He didn't want me to be part of the team or the wider company. I had to do what he wanted to do, and that became problematic. Problematic so to the point that Friendly Tester was born. And I'll quickly tell you how Friendly Tester was born. So we were in an open plan office, um, but we were siloed. So our little test team sat in the corner and the rest of the teams were everywhere else. And we were all meant to communicate via the tracking tools. However, one day I had this bug and you've probably all had a bug like it, a bug that is very hard to write to write down the steps and the impact of this bug. But if you just come and look at my screen for 10 seconds, you can see it. So I went to the developer's desk and I said, hey, Paul, I've got a bug. And he looked at me like I was some completely alien person <laughs> who um, had no right to talk to him. And I was like, hey, I've got a bug. Um, and he, he, he uh, eventually let me chat to him. And we debugged the bug together and we fixed it together and we retested it together. And then as I left, he said to me, you are the friendliest tester I've ever met. And that got me really puzzled. I was like, me? I, what do I do that was so good? And after I got a friendship with this guy and we still talk, um, yeah, every other tester he chatted to was all just throwing the bugs. That was it. Throwing the bugs over the wall. And this changed. This changed everything for me. I realized that I had strong skills, but I had to be working with other people to do them. Just throwing things into the abyss wasn't right. I had to start educating other people and learning from them and boosting my skills. And it threw people up to the top of my list. People suddenly became one of the most important aspects of my career. I could be the great tester ever, but I wanted to chat and I wanted to work with other people. And I realized that education was way to do that. Um, so 2012, six years into my career, now I started blogging. Uh, I wrote my first blog post in 2012, uh, and I think it was called sharing, <laughs> literally called sharing. I think it was just a request to share, ask people to keep sharing and sharing. But I started blogging, and it started getting traction. People started reading my blog, and it was all cool, and I was just kind of in my own little space, just blogging away, um, you know. I didn't know about wider communities yet. I was just blogging onto my website because one of the other members of my team kept a blog and one of the designers kept a blog and I thought it was cool. Uh, and I found it really useful from a reflection point of view. It really helped me go, well, what did I do today? What did I learn at work today? What was challenging today? And I started doing that a lot. And then I started sharing it and people started enjoying it. So blogging for me, while the blog is the thing that happens at the end and that's cool and people read it, the process of me reevaluating myself every day to see where I'd failed or where I'd succeeded became a habit for me. It became really crucial for me to do that. Um, but in the same year, a sad thing happened. I got promoted to management. 
And that's a sad thing. It's a sad thing because I was only 27. I can't count. Yes, <laughs> I was 26, 27. I wasn't ready. I hated it. And I mean hated it. I was doing all this great testing. I was reflecting. I was blogging. I was chatting. I was learning. And then I became this manager and I was meant to just look after these team of three or four testers. And I didn't know what to do. I was sad. I, I, I literally would go home and I'd be like, I did nothing today apart from talk to people. And I just simply wasn't ready for it. I didn't know what it was. I wanted the money. Manager badge sounded fantastic, but it, it wasn't for me. Um, I realized I had to be hands-on. I had to test. Uh, and I think now on reflection, it was a maturity thing. I wasn't mature enough to be a manager. I didn't really, um, I didn't have the skills. I didn't possess any of the skills to be a manager. Uh, it's doubtful if I still do, <laughs> but I didn't have the skills to be a manager. Um, and it was a kind of, it was a tough time. And I kind of rode that wave and I ended up leaving. Uh, I left to go and get an automation hands-on job because it just, and it was less pay. It just wasn't for me. Um, I wasn't ready. So 2012 was really one of the turning years, um, a real like complete explosion in my career. Uh, I discovered that there was people like you lot who get together and talk about testing. I went six years without knowing that was a thing. I, I didn't know at all. Um, when I worked in Manchester at the time, uh, a conference called Eurostar was two streets away from my office. No one in my team went. And now I know people in our community who were there. Awesome people were there in Manchester. I didn't have a clue. Um, but in 2012, I discovered um, the Selenium conference. I got very active in the Selenium community. It became a bit of a niche of mine. Started learning it a lot, started blogging about it a lot. And I became pretty much Mr. Selenium. I was blogging on tweeting all the time about Selenium. Uh, and I got a chance to go to the Selenium conference. Uh, and it was fantastic. Um, but again, I had a really eye-opening lesson there. I was, a sh I was pretty shy at the time. Um, but... Hillary knows this well, I like beer. So I was at the conference, I was in the hotel, and I went to the bar to get a beer. And at the bar was um, all the Selenium committers. They were all sat at the bar going off for a committee um, dinner. And I just pulled up a seat and sat there. Um, and they, uh, one of them started talking to me. And he just said, hello, you're here for the conference. And I was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you're, 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 uh, you look, it was Jim Evans. It's like, oh, you look after the IE driver. Oh, God, I fucking love you. You're amazing. Like the work you do, it's incredible. Proper fanboy moment. I'm like, oh, God, I love you. You're the best person I've ever met. Um, and he turned around and said, do you want to come, come for the dinner with us? And I was like, nah, 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 I'm all right. Anyway, I ended up going. Firefox paid for my steak dinner and I think Facebook bought all the drinks and I had the most incredible night and I built relationships with people like Simon Stewart and I started to realize um, that there was all these people that were passionate about testing as me and they were all out there already networking and communicating and blogging and going to conferences and I was like, oh, I need more of this, like this is what I need. And I started investing more of my own time in trying to achieve that. Uh, and yeah, it carried on after that. So 2013, uh, my clicker doesn't want to work. Uh, I, I was, that was it. I was obsessed with automation. I did nothing but automation. Um, and I really started diving into the world of wider automation and I kept job after job after job, which was all about automation. Um, couldn't think of anything else. For me, testing became all about automation. Exploratory testing, nah. Oracles, nah, not interested. Note taking, nah. Communication, none of that stuff. All about the code. I was straight in, fully fledged, obsessed with automation in code. And I went off on that journey for a while. And I got uh, invited to, I went to the Selenium conference. Did my first ever talk. I did a five minute lightning talk. You can watch it on YouTube. It's absolutely terrible. Um, I looked like a scared, like, squirrel in the headlights. Um, but I did it, and I liked it. I got off the stage, and I liked it, and I wanted more of it. And that led to me discovering some pretty cool things. And 2013 was the year everything changed. 
that's the only way I can say it. Everything changed. Um, I started my own meetup in Nottingham called Knox Test. Um, oh, I revived it. Someone started it and it kind of died down. I thought, you know what? If I want this and I want to network and meet people, I need to make that happen. I can drive that. I can be the one and I can bring people to me. And we can chat and we can network and engage and learn from each other. So I started the meetup. And then from that, I discovered Ministry of Testing and the, and, and the AST, the Association of Testing. And I was like, oh, my God, where have these people been? <laughs> this, this is the community here. This is amazing. And there was newsletters and there was feel like blog posts about books to read. And there was just I was surrounded by testers and I could not have been happy. I just didn't realize that these people existed. And that like, there's a rocket there that that lit a rocket for me. And I was I was away. Um, and then off the back of that, skills became important. So I started to learn of education opportunities that were out there that weren't what I'd been pushed on me. Certifications had been pushed on me and um, not just ISTQ, but even programming certifications were pushed on me. And I started to discover there was conferences. Uh, you could go to like Test Bash and you could go to CAS and people would do workshops and these people were like you. There were people who would like be, be testing in work every day. And then they've, they've you know, decided to build this workshop and you were learning from someone who actually does your job. And I was like, this is incredible. Um, and I went on uh, rapid software testing and I went to lots of workshops. I remember one by Hyde Scopes about visualization. Uh, and I went to lots of um, like smaller conferences as well. And I learned something really important. Uh, I learned that I needed it. And after that, every job I took, they had to offer it. They had to offer me training and it had to be the training I wanted, not the training they wanted to give me. It had to be the training that I wanted. They had to be willing to invest in me. And that again was a really seismic shift that I started realizing my value as a tester, but also as a person and someone who wants to go forward in their career. And I only wanted to work for people that were willing to invest in me in that way. And um, so I started as I said, that became a thing that I would ask for. How much pay do you want? I want this much pay and I want this much training. And yes, context, I was fortunate. There was a lot of automation jobs I could be picky and demanding. In the current climate right now, I would probably be less demanding, but at the time I could get away with it. <clears throat> but it started working and companies paid for me to go on stuff, the people that I worked for, and it was really, really rewarding. And so again, I started seeing the value of training and constantly learning. Um, earlier in my career, I wasn't. I was learning, but not not continuously. Just when it when it was needed. Uh, <clears throat> Two thousand and fourteen, social media became a big thing for me, uh, but not necessarily social media. I started building what I would call an information radiator. I realised that if I was going to continuously learn, I need information to come to me. So I started following people on Twitter. I started subscribing to newsletters, reading magazines. Um, getting as much information into me so that I can digest it when I want. And again, that was really crucial because I would get aware, awareness of things that I didn't know existed. Social media today, I open Twitter and someone posts a new tool or a new idea or someone's written a book or a blog, like they're coming to me now and it's really, really useful. So I wanted to stay up to date and I needed to make that happen. And I did that. and. It re really reaped its rewards. <clears throat> so 2014, um, <clears throat> again, I took a job in Nottingham and it really I, it re lit people. The job before I had to leave. The job before I had to leave because I became so obsessed with automation that I failed. I failed so hard. Um, and I've told this story a few times. I was in the meeting, I was, I was Mr. Selenium, I was brought into that company to write automation, but I was also the sole tester. And we went into a meeting one day and they asked me, how does this, how does feature A work? And I went, I don't know. And they were like, what do you mean you don't know? I don't know. I haven't got a clue. I've been writing regression scripts for the last six months. I have no idea how that part of the system works. And they're like, yeah, but you're the tester. I was like, nah, I'm the automator. I just, I just automate stuff. And <clears throat> I went home that night and I reflected and realized like, I wasn't testing our software anymore. 
I was automating things that probably people don't even use, but because it was in a test case and it was in a list of things for me to do, I continued to automate it. I was siloed. I would sit in the corner of that office just automating. And I'm not having a go at automation here. What I'm saying is I took my eye off what it meant to do my job or what I thought was my job. I realized that testing and what testing meant was gathering information for key people. And when someone asked me, how does this work? And I couldn't answer them. I felt awful and things had to change. And I tried to change it, but they still wanted automation. So I left. Um, <clears throat> and 2014 was um, a real huge opportunity for me. So um, I went independent. I took the opportunity to go um, independent. And there was a few key reasons for this. Firstly, the community had been so welcoming to me that I started to get offers for training and workshops. And I started to realize that you could be paid for these things. And that was really cool. And speaking opportunities, there was an option there to start being paid for these things. I thought, well, that's really interesting. But the real reason um, that I also took the leap was that I wanted to take control of my own career a little bit. I'd been, I'd been treated well and I'd been treated badly. And I decided that I kind of have a vision of myself and where I want to go. So I took ownership of my own career from a standpoint of jobs as well as um, my, my education. And I know that's not an option for everyone, but it was really crucial for me at the time that I did it. I left a really good job to actually do this, um, but uh, it allowed me um, to start doing that. However, <clears throat> um, another epic fail. Um, I learned really hard that you need to pick your battles. Um, I was, a, I was a, um, a contractor on this job and as a contractor in that context of that job, they brought me in just to do a job. They just wanted me to do, be part of the team. They didn't really want opinions from me and advice. They wanted me to literally just to be hands on. We need extra support, do what we ask you kind of thing. And again, I, 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 I sacrificed that because I, I got my independence of running my own company and things. Um, but I didn't learn the shift that you have when you're no longer an employee and you're a contractor. And I pushed back and I pushed back really hard and I got fired. <laughs> uh, it's the one time in my career that I got fired. Um, I got fired because I picked the wrong battles. I tried to change a company's approach to testing that didn't want me there to do that. They wanted me there to carry on their existing patterns and just help them do what they wanted. And I was like, nah, this is wrong. And I pushed back and I got fired. And ever since then, I always ask myself, yes, I've got an opinion, but is this a battle I'm willing to fight? And I am very cautious of that these days and only engage when it is actually benefit and not just because I think my worldviews are correct. Uh, but 2015, again, I got to shift. I ended up working for a consultancy called Equal Experts, some of the fan most fantastic people I've ever worked with. And again, people became apparent to me how important people are working with really good people. And also context became key, it was mobile. Five years ago, mobile was still, it's hot, you know, really bubbling out, new iPhones all the time, lots of apps and stuff. And it was a really fascinating domain to be in. And I realized again, that context mattered to me. The thing I was working on mattered to me and people really mattered to me. And I started to appreciate them a lot more, especially from the job before where I got fired for um, you know, causing up and pickling the wrong fights. And yeah, that was a really important time again to slow down and be like, people matter. Uh, people really do. Um, but at the same time, this job was contracting, but from a consultancy angle. So I was meant to advise. I was meant to recommend. I was meant to um, recommend suggestions and approaches. And I didn't have the skills. I'm still technical Richard, Mr. Automation and everything that goes with that. I didn't know how to convince people. I didn't know how to talk to management and C-level people and more executives like people. I didn't know how to do it. So I needed to learn. And one of the things that I did is I invested in myself. Um, I was fortunate enough, my company had built up some reserves and I sent myself on a course called Problem Solving Leadership um, by Jerry Weinberg and Esther Darby. And I had the time of my life, five and a half days that literally broke me. Um, but I came away with some of the most important skills that have allowed me to continue to grow. 
So yes, I got my technical skills and my testing skills, but now I was better at communicating with people. I started to work on my facilitation skills, my management skills, uh, my people skills. Uh, and as I said, I realized people were so important to me, but I wasn't the best at dealing with them. So I needed to improve that. Following on from there, I started teaching more. So I mentioned I did a few workshops, but this is the year I really started pushing it. I wanted to be a good teacher. And I had a slight advantage. My partner is a teacher. <laughs> so I started getting Sarah to help me. How do I teach people? How can I be a good teacher? How can I structure my learning? And I realized as well that I learned so much by teaching other people. So I mentioned that my reflection activities were really good for my blogs and things. But when I tried to teach people, I realized that a lot of teaching that was out there, they hadn't realized their own seismic shifts. So one thing I learned in my career is I started to spot the seismic shifts in my understanding. Uh, and when I, when I started realizing that testing was more than automation, that was a, such a seismic shift that I could never go back to that style of thinking. When I realized how to properly facilitate a room, I can no longer go back. But if I teach facilitation now, you might start with how you do it now. And people can't relate to that. People have to relate to the step you were at before. And as a teacher, you need to be introducing them to that step. And that became really powerful. I started reflecting a lot more. How did I learn that? It's like, well, you, you take it, you think everyone knows stuff and you have to think back, how did I learn that? And that became really powerful in my teaching. Um, and again, continued to this day. Every time I'm teaching now, I try and remember how do I get someone from where they are to where they need to be and how did I do it? Uh, reflection was really key. Uh, and yeah, 2016, um, I took my independence a little bit more and I got involved with Ministry of Testing a bit more and I brought um, Test Bash to Manchester. And <clears throat> I know um, Hilary himself has got experience of bringing conferences to other cities and that was terribly exciting. Again, I mentioned the meetup and the meetup was awesome. The meetup feels great. Like Hilary right now probably feels great because 20, 30 people are together. They're together because he made something happen. And that's what I had with Test Bash. I brought 200 testers to Manchester and it felt incredible. And um, I realized that I can have an influence on other people's careers and I can do things that are gonna boost them. And I'm doing it because it feels good for me. It made me feel good. And it made me realize that I needed to share and be a part of this community. And if I can do more and I have the capacity, I wanted to do more. And that's what giving Test Bash, um, creating Test Bash in Manchester really helped. I got to create something. It was very, very rewarding to be able to give back to the wider communities for how it had helped me in the last 10 years. Uh, I really enjoyed that. Uh, and then, yeah, 2017, um, chatting with Rosie Sherry, the lady behind MOT, and she said, you want to be the boss, the boss boss of MOT? Our silly names for CEO. And I was like, no. <laughs> She's like, what do you mean? No. It's like, no. I don't want to run a company. I have no idea how to run a company. How, how the hell am I going to run a company? I've been running my little consultancy of a one-man team, but how am I going to run a company like this? Um, but anyway, she convinced me, she coached me, she mentored me, and I think that was one of the things, that was one of the times where I'd really had the value of coaching and having a mentor. I'd never really had a mentor prior to this. I'd had people that I followed, and people that I respected and I learned from, but I'd never had one-to-one -one mentoring on a regular scale. And this is where I realized that I'd also never had a manager that really mentored me. And I found that sad. Um, why have I gone 11 years in my career without a manager who really appreciated me, who coached, who wanted, to, especially on the testing side, who coached me and taught me the ways uh, the very first manager was very good, but I never got to spend time with him and I didn't know that I needed him. Whereas if I was going back into a job now, I would really look for a leader in the company that's going to coach me and mentor me and help me on these times. Um, but anyway, I took the role and it was really, you know, terrifying, but I did it. And obviously I'm still doing it today, which is great. Uh, two more to go. If my clicker wants to work, let's just use the keyboard. Oh, there we go. Um, so yeah, 2018, 
I was now ready. So ministry of testing, we have a team of nine people. I was actually ready now. I was ready to lead them. I was ready to coach them and facilitate them and help them be the best they can be. Back in 2014, I wasn't ready. I was not ready at all. And I, I, I'm so happy that I realized it then. And now I was more comfortable. I was ready to help guide them and in turn guide the wider, the wider community. And that, um, again, was me reflecting on my own skill set and saying, can I do this? Am I ready for it? And I was. And 2019, um, it's a picture of Ralph. So in 2019, I, um, I had several burnouts and pretty severe um, burnouts. So um, burnouts to the point where I couldn't move like for like five days. Um, and it, like, I, I did all these things that I did, but I took the eye off me, me as a person. I took my, I so focused on helping everyone else and helping the community and pushing my, pushing, you know, my, my, my own skill set. I, I, I couldn't move. I, I'm not even lying. I couldn't move. Um, I had to stay in bed for about four days. My brain was just melted. And I started to realize that I needed to look after me a bit more. And this little guy has been so helpful ever since. Take him for walks, playtime. He brings me a little toys and demands that I play with him. And I started to value a bit of wellness time, a bit of zoning out. And if anyone at MOT is watching this, they'll be absolutely pissing themselves, saying he's full of shit. He works 20 hours a day still. Yeah, I do. But I used to work 22 hours a day. And, you know, and I'm getting less and less and less as I go. But really important, I learned to look after me, uh, look after my well-being, uh, make sure I'm healthy, hydrated, <laughs> as we were joking earlier, uh, and focusing on, you know, also my health and well-being instead of just pushing, pushing, pushing on from the career perspective. Uh, and then that's where we're at today. So to recap, um, obviously, a lot of failures, a lot of successes. And but I realized for me as a person, I need to share. I have to share. Um, it helps me reflect. It helps me learn. Sharing for me motivates me. I feel good about it. Yes, I'm probably guilty of a bit of social media, um, you know, enjoyment, like, you know, probably like one too many likes and one too many retweets, but they make me feel good. Uh, but really, it's the act of sharing my knowledge, which I found really great value, but value in. Can't emphasize enough the importance of people. Surround yourself by good people. If you don't have them at work, find them in communities like uh, Meetup of Test. Um, find them in communities around the world, AST, uh, Ministry of Testing, Selenium. All these communities are there. Surround yourself by really cool people uh, and try and learn from them and you know, create friends. I've, create, I've got so many friends out of the testing community. Um, it's really, really awesome. So yeah, people matter so much. And then skills. Everything I did, the talking, the blogging, the information radiators, the training, give yourself the right skills and demand or try and encourage your company to invest in you and invest in your skills um, because they're going to help you continue. And right now in our industry, very few skills last very long. Tooling changes all the time, but there is a core set of skills, especially around yourself as a person and leadership, facilitation, testing theories. They don't really change too much. So make sure you've got the right set of skills. Uh, and that's where I'm at today. Um, I'm happy. I, I'm stressed right now because of COVID and what it's doing to me and the, <laughs> the company uh, and whatever obviously around the whole world. Um, but as a person, I've realized the things I enjoy in my career and the fact that I got there in 10 years makes me really happy because I've got, well, probably can't retire now given where the world's going for what, another 45 years. So I've got 45 years um, to ride this wave of things that I enjoy. And just lastly, I would say if I encourage you to do one thing that you can do, because you can't obviously do my career, and that was my, my, my journey, I strongly encourage every single one of you to reflect and reflect regularly. Um, I was going to show, like, uh, I forgot about it. Like, this is like a fifth of my um, notebooks. I reflect all the time and I write it in books 
Um, I write down my thoughts. I challenge myself every all the time to try and make myself realize what I've done well and done um, and what I haven't done well. And reflection for me has been that most important thing. And it doesn't take long. You can be sat in the car, sat in you know driving home, sat on a train. Just regularly ask yourself, what are the best I can be today? Could I have been better? What did I learn today? And that's helped me no end on everything, every single scale that I said. Uh, so yeah, that's me. Uh, take some questions. Sorry, it was seven minutes over. I apologize. Can't hear anything. Is that me or is that because no one's talking? I think it's because no one's talking, right? What's I think Hillary's frozen yeah. or muted himself or something. Um Cool, let me move this smaller. Oh, Hillary's calling me. Hello, sir. Okay. No worries, I'll take some questions from Slido. All right, bye. Uh, <laughs> that is meta. Answering the phone and that you can hear the air. That's crazy. Um, right, let me see if I can find that Slido thing and we'll... Uh... Right, how did I find that chat window that I had a minute ago? Whoa, I can see everyone's face right now. That's crazy. Ah, thank you, Paul. Do, do, do. Oh, it turns out you can't click links in uh, this tool. Uh, let's go Chrome. Oh wow, this tool! No wonder his computer's froze. This tool is like well taken over my computer. <laughs> the sound gone now. Oh, it's because I muted myself. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Anonymous, are we allowed to encourage you to rest or do you have people looking out for you on that side of things? Uh, thank you, Anonymous. Um, no, I have people <laughs> looking out on me and people checking on me uh, quite a lot now. Um, so um, especially people at Ministry of Testing, I'm obviously my colleagues, they look after me and my partner, Sarah, um, is well aware of um, trying to stop that from happening. Anonymous is Vernon, so Vernon is another one who regularly checks in on me. Um, I would say one thing that I did do, probably for the not probably about four years ago, I kept the testing community as the testing community and not as friends. So I made a very good point to still have work over there, but then I soon realised that the testing community were friends. <laughs> And I enjoyed spending time with them and I wanted to, you know, to do other things like go to football with them and go for meals and stuff. And uh, again, I, for a long time, I tried to keep it separate and that's probably wasn't useful. Um, well, well, I don't know what order these things. Oh, they've got votes. Okay. Yeah. Vote for questions on Slido if you want. I'll start from the top. Um, so Sylvia is asking me what resources, activities, et cetera, have you found most useful for developing your leadership, influencing and facilitating skills? Um, other than Rosie, um, I would say Jerry Weinberg. So becoming a technical leader um, and most of Jerry's writing, to be honest, um, I am now the host of this meeting. I've been promoted in this meeting. What, what, what a great session. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, so Jerry Weinberg's stuff on leadership is absolutely fantastic. Um, he, the, the problem solving leadership, obviously, sadly, Jerry died. Um, but obviously mm -hmm. his, his memory lives on in all his work, but you can still take the course with Don Gray and Esther Darby. It's five and a half days. Um, it's quite intense, but they challenge you in so many ways that they put you in scenarios and simulations that are so real. <laughs> um, and yeah. you really start to shine through. And the, one of the things I would say is in the course, they put a huge emphasis on observers. 
So they get other people to observe your behavior. So if there's someone at work that you work closely with, maybe ask them to be your observer and they will spot some of the things that you do that you might not be aware of. And they might be good things, but they might also be bad things. And um, I was guilty in my early stages of not really listening. So I would already have solved the problem from what the person's telling me. And then I would just wait till they're finished speaking and then be like, this is what you need to do. Um, yeah. Did you say anything for the last five minutes? Because I didn't really hear what you were saying because I was so fixated on telling you this awesome solution. And now I'm better at coaching and encouraging them to get to the answer themselves. And I think that was one of the differences was, yes, I have an answer. How can I take them to the answer instead of just telling them what to do? Um, <clears throat> and there's a guy, there's a tester actually, he's not a tester anymore, he's a coach, but um, Toby Sinclair, he's done lots of fantastic blogging um, on facilitation especially. And he does a very good workshop, which I'm not sure if he runs. And I know he's a big part of the Lego serious play. Oh, yeah. Um, which I've heard really good things about. I've not done it myself, um, but I've heard positive things about it. Hilary, you're back. I am indeed. I'm, I'm terribly sorry. I just had a complete freeze. I had to reboot my machine and I was uh, super worried that the whole instance of the WebEx meeting will crash, but apparently it didn't because I made you a presenter. So that was a good choice. Ah, clever. Okay. And the second question, someone's asking for... Uh, more information on problem solving leadership. I'm actually going to delegate that to Hillary because I know you tried to host this course recently or you did host the course. Well, uh, um, uh, no, I didn't. Um, so the um, so PSL has a, a long history. It is a course that was started by Jerry Weinberg, who is one is basically the grandfather of testing. So he was the person who uh, built the first ever testing team on the Mercury Space Project. Uh, in, in the 50s. So this was in the 50s. He was a person who had the first testing team. Uh, and his uh, life um, goal was to make smart people happy. So um, as you might know, that sm smart, we, well, well if, if, if you're smart yourself, you know that smart people are sometimes not very happy. And his goal was to make smart people happy. So he built a problem solving leadership course in 1975. Uh, which is a long time ago. And he ran that course until um, very recently, where unfortunately, um, Jerry is no longer among us. Um, very fortunate, the course still exists with Esther Derby and uh, Don Gray, who uh, continue running the course in, in Albuquerque. Uh, there are some um, initiatives to bring the course to Europe. Uh, but uh, there's nothing concrete uh, right now. But however, problem solving leadership is is a life changing course. I did in 2013, and I completely agree with Richard that it is. So what the way I would describe it, it, it is the most brutal mirror you get set in front of yourself, and you get you, you get to know yourself uh, in all aspects of who you are, uh, some of which are not very comfortable. Uh, but it is absolutely worth it. It's, it, is, it is a brilliant course. Yeah, actually, to answer your question again, Sylvia, I think you put it straight there. I invested a lot of time in working out who I was. Okay. Um, and like you said, the course helped that. You know, it is a mirror into myself, but I, I started asking a lot more people as well, like, what, how, what do you think about me or what, what was my approach mm -hmm. like there? And really trying to fully understand me, because I know the things that I do that, people don't like, but I also know that there's some things I really can't change or yeah. it would take such an investment to change that bit of me that something else would be impacted that would probably cause more damage. Um, so I became quite open with that. So uh, yeah, that, that was a big help. <clears throat> Rich, can, I, can I just quickly ask, so yeah, I guess you answered Sylvia's question right now on, <clears throat> on, on Slido, right? I was yes. The questions already on the on the Slido, so I, I, I can. Answered, uh, I answered the one about are you allowed to encourage you to rest? That got answered. Um, and that was, yeah, I think that's it. Oh yeah, the one, the fourth one down. Are we allowed to encourage you to rest, or do you have people looking out for you? That one's gone. Uh, say it again. Which one? The fourth one. 
the fourth was yeah, it's now the fifth one, but yeah, the one from anonymous at six forty four p m okay, right, I click away my cool. This one. You want okay. to read them out then, Hillary, or do you want me to continue? Or? Yeah, just go go ahead. I, I oh, will cool. just okay. have admin overhead. Um, so Anonymous, again, which I believe is Vernon, um, is asking, what are you hoping to achieve in the next three to five years in your current role? Uh, and what are you looking to teach people who come to your site and um, come to you and visit your site? So, oh, it was not you. Oh, okay. Well, whoever asked that, fantastic. Um, Obviously, this is in the context of Ministry of Testing. If you'd asked me this six months ago, I would have had really big plans for you. Right now, my goal is to thrive. <laughs> my goal is to keep Ministry of Testing going and trying to keep my team together. And it's a real challenge in time. So we lost 70% of our income um, because we can't run conferences. And trying to keep a business going on that front is obviously very challenging. Um, we're quite fortunate that Graham and Rosie had a, a very um, disciplined strategy of whenever we were profitable, we would save some of that money. And that money is now what's keeping us going. Um, and obviously we're, we're pivoting and changing, but yeah, that's challenging. If we do get past, which I'm sure we will, I joked about ISTQB and I know there's other, you know, there's other certifications, but, um, I want everyone to understand the educational value of community. And I want that community to be providing the best courses and content for everyone to learn who wants to progress in a testing career. I want people to take low cost education. I want not necessarily low cost, but I want it to be more accessible to people. And I don't want it to be based on this piece of paper. I want people to take real courses that produce real learning outcomes, that produce real evidence of learning. And I want to give them a place to showcase that learning. So you don't go to a job interview with a piece of paper. You go for a job interview with a with a stories and experiences and a place to back that up. Um, but I want more people to know that community is a thing. Um, and I want to push the boundaries of education in our space because I don't think they've been pushed strong enough. There's people doing great things but it's still dominated by this obsession to chase pieces of paper. And that's definitely one aspect of me that I want to change, but the education side and then the people side, I want testers to be nowhere to get help, nowhere to get support. And I want to showcase the best organizations at doing it. And that's what I'm going to try and achieve with a uh, ministry of testing. Cool. Excellent. Thanks, Richard. So what I would propose here is that <clears throat> I think it, it it makes it more personable if people just unmute themselves and ask a question in person. Okay. Um, I, think, I think that that makes sense. It is it is possible with the, the number of people there. Um, just one, one comment on the whole uh, community building and connection. Um, this is one of the things that I'd like to advocate as well, is that just uh, connect yourself with, with other people. Uh, so if you're in a course uh, on testing, with some people, just try to make sure that uh, you get the context of all the people and uh, that you stay in contact. There's so much to learn if, if you, you get connected with other testers. So <clears throat> now I would like to um, just invite anyone uh, just to unmute themselves and, and ask questions directly. It's going to be pretty well, Vernon, yeah. is if you can unmute himself. I, I, so I've got a Can everyone hear me okay? Can you hear me okay, mate? Yep. Yes, Vernon. Um, okay. I'll, I'll just ask uh, a question. I, I had two questions in the chat. Um, I don't know which one to ask. Okay, so I'll, I'll ask this one. Would you encourage people who are joining the software development industry as a whole to um, to follow a career in software testing? Um, the reason I ask is because there's always, there's a lot of, there seems to be a lot of conversation around, you know, becoming quality coaches, um, moving out of testing to have a bigger impact on quality and that kind of thing. So I wondered what you thought about that being the boss boss of Ministry of Testing. <laughs> I think there's a few interesting things to that angles to that question. So first thing I would say, yes, I would absolutely encourage anyone to go into a software testing career. Um, Correct answer. Is the landscape of software testing changing? Absolutely. Of course it is. Mm -hmm. um, but it's being driven by 
the fact that the world is changing so much. So one thing that COVID has made a lot of companies realize is they were not tech ready. Um, they weren't ready to change the way they worked and the way they delivered their services and products. Um, of course, no one expected COVID, don't get me wrong, but there, a lot of companies have realized that software is really crucial. And I think we'll actually see an insane spike in software. So not just you know, actual more software in the world, uh, which obviously needs creating by people, it needs testing by people. So I see a lot more software companies starting up. I see a lot more established companies investing a lot more in software. Uh, and also software is now everywhere, literally everywhere. I love the story by um, Robert Royce, who Boeing asked Rolls Royce to build an engine that was capable of, I can't remember exactly now, but 17,000 tons of thrust. So Rolls-Royce built an engine that was 20,000 tons of thrust and then limited it with software because they know that in two years' time, both are going to come along and say, I want a 20,000 ton engine and they're already going to have one. Um, now, in terms...